Hello, everybody. We are back. I'm Tom Sosnoff. I'm here with Dylan Radigan. Mr. Radigan, how art thou? Uh, I, I want to know what you're doing on your computer screen. Everybody at home wants to know. So I don't want to talk to everybody at home. Okay. So I, think I, I get to talk to Tom. I've been talking to Tom once a week for like maybe 10 years. Plus, on and off. Not the whole time, but a lot. Which is either a curse or a blessing. I think of it as a blessing. Um, says lots of things, lots of things, lots of things. But he also does lots of things. And sometimes he's busy doing lots of things and he's so content. He's like a, like a child playing with his, with his Legos. And you don't really even know what he's doing. He's just kind of hanging out there, a little click, a little. And then once in a while you hear a little bell ring. I, I am very much... To me, the trading screen is like a child playing with Legos. I, I mean, I, know. I think you nailed it. Um, well, the the Fed just came out with their, um, you know, with, with the number and whatever that was. I have no idea. Um, but I'm a, um, you know, I'm just a... I'm just an opportunist, right? So You're just a Midwestern opportunist. I'm just a Midwestern opportunist. I bought some bonds, just scalped them on, on the Fed number. You know, took a couple ticks, and um, bought in some um, crude oil calls that we sold this morning, and just uh, reduced the rolled down some calls in the spiders and the Qs to um, neutralize my delta. And other than that, um, wow, I don't think much. Um, but it, but so all of your positions right now are more or less are exploiting, I'm assuming, some version of volatility compression after the meeting, more than a direction of a, of a, of a bond or a stock. Yes, that would be that would be a very um, honest and fair assumption. Yes, that's that's basically what that's that's who I am. Like, basically, you're like, maybe it'll go up, maybe it'll go down, but there's no way there's not volatility doesn't come out. On the other side of this meeting. Well, the funny thing is the the, the Nasdaq S and P's are down six, which is nothing. The Nasdaq's down sixty eight, which is nothing. Um, the Dow's up a hundred, and the Russell's up two, and volatility's down eight cents right now. So I would say this is about the the biggest non event we've seen. Um, my yeah, this is about the biggest non event we've seen on a on a Fed number. But you know what, the Fed still isn't officially. Yakking up a storm yet, it, Dylan? It's been really slow the last couple of days. I mean, like paint dry slow, which is kind of peculiar. No, I mean, I, I, I mean, we're getting into that season where it will be a little peculiar if it keeps up like this. Right now, I think it's okay. What, what you're saying we have to like they can be slow till October first. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying usually the week after after triple witching in September is usually when it starts to get a little busy, and um, it hasn't gotten busy yet this week. That's all. But you don't consider that to be an issue. I don't consider it to be an issue. I've been around the block too many times. It's never an issue. Every time I think that it's the end of the world as we know it, or the end of the business as we know it, either one of the two, I'm wrong. So I've ended my end of the world messages as I used to give them. Uh, I remember t on the trading floor, we were in the 1987 crash when the when basically I thought the entire industry was wiped out. And I remember um, coming into work the next day after the crash or two days later and standing in the pit going to the guy next to me, you know, this is it for us. Like I was I was 30. It's been fun. Like, it's been fun. I go, it's been real. But, you know, this business is never coming back. And truthfully, the business never turned around. Never, never, never. Look, the, the real answer was the business never looked back. It, it, it was. We didn't lose a day. Like it didn't go away for a day. And I think in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, I had some of the same, you know, concerns. Um, the end of two thousand eight, two thousand nine, I was like, you know, I don't think the public's going to recover from this. It's just, this is just a bad situation. And the same thing actually in 2002, 2003, you know, this is just a bad sell off. I don't know, you know, how we're going to recover. And then it always comes back. Everything always comes back. And no, that's not reversion to the mean because we debated that this morning on the network in case you missed it. We had I've our heard, first I've heard rumors. I've heard rumors of this. We debate. had our first debate. Um, Jacob Perlman, I will just say, is an incredibly hard person to debate against. Why is that too much, too much evidence, too many facts and figures? He's too damn smart. He's just too damn smart. Too much everything. 
Um, Jacob was born to, 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 to you, you may go after him in something, you know, you can debate him on who's better jets or giants, you know, or uh, you know, if you want to bulls or Knicks type of thing, but you cannot debate him on, you know, which math equation holds up best under the, <laughs> under a test of, of certain scrutiny. Um, it just, you cannot do it. Um, I don't care what PhD you are. I don't care who you are. You cannot debate that man. But it was really fun. We debated the um, the idea of whether there is such a thing as mean reversion in price. And I think Jacob put that to bed pretty nicely. There is no mean reversion in price. I mean, he, I thought there was you, you've been telling you've been telling me there's no mean reversion in price for a long time. I know. And uh, Dr. Jim um, uh, basically wanted to. He wanted to, to take it to take issue. He took issue. He took issue to that. He confuses huh. positive drift with uh, mean reversion, but that's OK. Yeah, he's, he's not here to defend himself, so we don't want to drag him through the mud. Here. No, that's the best time to drag him through the mud when they can't defend themselves, because that's <laughs> that's the time you can't you know you can't lose. Um, all right, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about Dylan well, Radigan's right. topic of the yeah. week. Uh, Fed topic just came of, out, by the way, yeah. and nothing much. Nothing much. Topic of the week is a market with a million reasons to go lower that has no interest in going lower. First of all, I, I have a, a second topic of the week, but the, my first topic of the week is the relative, even if the market is, let's say it's been going sideways-ish for some time, yeah. it's going sideways-ish after a substantial advancement in the first half of the year. Okay. There's plenty of reason for it to go down. Okay. And yet it has no interest in going down. And the only way that I can possibly reconcile that is that it that the overwhelming optimism of the future, whether it's the future in tech, the future in AI, the future in EV, you know, pick your version of um, next generation commercial life is so strong that there is no inflation fear or interest rate fear or higher oil price fear or fear of, you know, stress in commercial or residential real estate market fear that whatever fears you can gin up, that they are viewed as secondary to the overwhelming tsunami of optimism that supports the strength of the American economy and the strength of American innovation and industry to overwhelm any of these things as anything more than a road bump. Um, I, you're, you're, you're kind of asking me for um, uh, some form of validation to your fundamental what I'm, I'm asking you whether you believe that the market that, that have given the choice between the world's never-ending list of problems and risks and given the list of all the beautiful happy future things that are in the cooker and then average price levels as the three components of the discussion with the price level always being some reconciliation between those two I'm actually somewhat surprised that the prices are at that. I guess I feel like I'm more pessimistic than the market is about the world. And I've, I'm interested how you would look at th those three factors. I think that that's completely normal. And I think that that everybody tends to be more pessimistic than the market is. Just it's that is the general use case. And and for that reason, you know, the market's higher. The market's a very. The, the the beautiful thing about the market is that there's only there's only two sides, and when when everybody's on one side, the marketplace usually takes the other side. It's the it's the great counterparty. I I I think that um, you know my biggest mistake in 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 the world of finance for myself personally over the last couple of decades is I I never really understood that, and I've always thought that the optimism that the market displayed see i misread the optimism i, I misread the markets i mis misread the market in the sense that i always thought the market optimism was was public optimism what i didn't realize was the market's optimism is public pessimism and I, I completely misread that over the years. and i always felt like you know what i'm bearish because everybody else is bullish I never realized that I was bearish and so was everybody else. So I misread that. And I thought, I think the market, um, 
the market has every reason. Like, like when you when you look back at and at who we are, until somebody just dethrones us, I don't I don't know that you're going to see anything that's too much different. And, it, I mean, and it's interesting because you talked about oh, when after eighty seven, you're like we're never coming back, or after eight or sure. eight oh nine. I mean, it's sort of the same exact thing where you're like. Yeah. Like that's just another. It's all the same narrative. But it's interesting that the, that your articulation now is that the market's optimism is not built on you. You thought you're like I'm unusual. I'm smarter exactly. than everybody else. Exactly. I'm, you know, I'm the I'm the one who knows. Like the the, the rainy. It's going to rain on Saturday. Trust me, it rains on Saturday. No one thinks everybody thinks it's going to be sunny. It's going to rain. Meanwhile, everybody thinks it's going to rain. But but if that if the public view is generally more pessimistic than the market's view, what's driving the market price? Is it the is it the permanence of institutional capital like from the pension funds and CalPERS and Blackstone and whatever, where they're like, listen, like we have a macroeconomic we've allocated money to EVs, AI, um, you know, whatever, streaming entertainment, uh, lithium mines, whatever the whatever the macro assessment is. And we have a good hundred billion dollars a quarter to invest from the teachers or the cops or the whatever. And I, we're I, buying stocks. I, I always thought the the old adage of the market loves to ride the wall of worry. I always thought that that meant that the market loved it when there was all this bad news so it could just rally up and and it would just it would it would rally up because you know just on the on the base of on the base of all this bad news i never realized that the market loves to ride the wall of worry was really reflecting the consumer sentiment about the market and not the market trying to reflect the fundamentals around us you know the market i i believe the market as has it, it has the the it works the same way that like Amazon and Uber and and Meta and all those crazy growth stocks worked. The market has the ability to look way ahead, way past any of us, and and we are inherently much more um, skeptical and and um, and we're we're non our human nature is to be a non believer, and it's to be a contrarian, and the, so the market's not actually riding a wall of worry at all it's just taking the opposite side it's the master counterparty and it's just and 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 we we are just all part of the mass i always thought the i always thought the genius of my of my in the financial service space my own genius was that i was never public i never realized that i am public and the market the market knows that and and the only thing that's kept me alive for 40 some odd years in the market is the fact that I'm a strategist. So I'm able to, you know, I'm able to live on the on the stuff that falls through the cracks. You know, I live on the grubs. And, 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 and obviously you've made no bone. You've made your strategy very public. Yeah. You've made a business out of your strategy, which is mean uh, volatility, mean reverts. Yeah. And when and if you trade in liquid names with high implied volatility relative to itself with good pot odds over time, you will beat the house, so to speak. In or you spite, have a better, a better spite, chance than most. In spite of your own, um, in spite of your own, um, in spite of your own inability to pick market direction, even though there's only two directions. Like, it's absolutely amazing that we're wrong as much as we are because, y y you know. You should be right at least half the time. There's not a lot of choices. <laughs> there's, there's only, you know, eventually, you know, you know, heads, no, it's tails, tails, no, it's heads, you know, like eventually you got to be right a couple of times. And I think that the funniest thing about the market is that like, you know, we all, we have this crazy, I, I just think that we haven't really understood it. The market is just this brilliant, absolutely brilliant genius mechanism that is, that makes us think that, that if we follow it, we're public. But the reality is, when we fade it, we're kind of public. But which nobody means can, I've never heard anybody so explain it, it that way. Which, which then I can make an argument that like stop trying to outsmart yourself, buy yourself some Tesla, Amazon, Meta, Nvidia, Visa, like buy you know ten of those stocks and call it a day, and then and then and then trade volatility for mean reversion. Like basically, just get long. Good luck.
<laughs> Good luck, Mr. Radigan. Good luck. May but the force be that? with you. Why? I, but uh, but the obvious. Do you say that obviously because the probability that that works is is almost non-existent. Although the probability that it, that it doesn't work is even worse, but um, to take the other side is even even more dangerous. But yeah, I mean, it's just again, it's it's not human nature at all. So, you know, we do what we do because I can sit here and explain to you um, optimal mechanics, and I feel good about it. I can't sit here and explain to you that I feel good about telling you to do the opposite of what you actually think you should do. <laughs> Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Whether it's George Costanza or the uh, opposite exactly. of George Costanza. Exactly. They both could be well losing strategies. Right. I can't tell you to buy the market because everything that you're looking at about what's going on in the world, like you just explained it, is 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 bad. Hey, buy the market because everything is bad or sell the market because everything is good. That is an extremely hard hard argument to make and to get people to actually buy into it. It is a lot easier to to talk about mechanics, which is why Tasty is so popular. Because people want something they can control. Yeah, sure. It's and they can't control. control any. They can't control any outcome, but they can get better at the mechanics. It's, it's all about control the things you can control. Talk about it all the time. That is it. Are you surprised that the Federal Reserve was able to get through this meeting and basically have the market do nothing-ish? I was not surprised because based on implied volatility today being down all day and based on the fact that the market hasn't done anything for a couple of straight days, I think there was a huge message in there that, hey, whatever you think is about to happen, it is not about to happen. So don't get, your, <laughs> don't get all excited because nothing is going to happen. When you expect something, when you expect, this is what's even more amazing. When you expect nothing to happen and nothing happens, you're kind of weirded out by it. And when you expect big moves and the big move happens, you're weirded out by that. So like, like I am one of these people that like when they, when I expect a big move and we, ha we get a big move, then I get mad because we had a big move <laughs> and I didn't believe it. <laughs> Today, there was every single message that the market was telling us was that nothing was going to happen and nothing happened. Now I'm mad because nothing happened. It's okay. You know what? I've I've learned to deal with this. I've come you, to grips you, with it. This is you. You started. You learned to cope with this many decades ago. Yes. Yes. I have. This is. But this, this is, is part life. of training a tasty trader. Yeah. This is my life. It seriously is. It is to get more comfortable with that aspect. Okay. Onward we go. The labor situation is one of the many reasons. Like the reasons why the market should go lower. One, it's up way too much, way too fast. Inflation is oddly maybe under control, but maybe not. No one really knows. Real estate's got to be screwed, but it's not. Um, oil continuing to press up. It has to be hitting somebody somewhere, especially on the manufacturing side. And you got now you're running strikes. Um, all these things. Is the private sector necessarily better at navigating all of the disruptive who's better basically at navigating all those disruptive factors the private or the public sector who is better at navigating all the disruptive factors boy that is a very interesting question um well I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure where you where you want to go with this, but um, on the surface, my, the first thing that comes to my my mind is that it has to be the private sector because I would fe I feel like the private sector is more efficient, and the private sector has is measured by um, you know the private sector in a in 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 a free market um, is measured very differently than, government doesn't have to be efficient. Government can survive in an inefficient ecosystem. And they live in an inefficient ecosystem. They can survive in an inefficient ecosystem. Um, they, they are not part of, of a, a free market. They're not true, cap, it's not a true capitalist system. So I would assume that that the private sector is um, more efficient for, for all for just because they live in a different world and they have to be reasonably efficient in order for them to survive to and do I, business. I, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that. 
next iteration of the question is, do labor unions make the private sector more efficient or less efficient? Um, they make it far more efficient. They make it more efficient because they 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 democratize the the um, the private sector. You know, they're they're they they spread the they um, they spread the uh, decision making over a much over much greater territory. So if if you don't if you don't have unions and you're and you don't have a voice, then then how could you know how how could that be better? Well, I would say that if you have if you're saying we the private sector prioritizes adaptability, flexibility, uh, and efficiency. Part of adaptability, flexibility, and efficiency is the freedom to quickly hire more people and or fire more people. I, I don't. It is, I don't it have is a the efficiency to to share compensation so that when the company makes more money, everybody makes more money, and when profits decline at the company, everybody makes less money. I I don't but, fundamentally have a problem with any of that, but the concept of decision of of who owns the decision making throughout the process and who has a voice is more valuable than all of that. So, because again, it democratizes the entire space. And I think that is the real key to um, to capitalism um, working at its finest. You, the more decision makers, um, the, uh, the, the, more, the more the system, the more decision makers, the more the system works. That's all it is. If you, if you limit the decision making to a group of, of of too few, it is the the group is subject to manipulation and corruption. Where if it's on a broader scale, there's okay, less okay. likelihood. So 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 let's go with your thesis, which I can see the logic, which is that when you have labor, when you have organized labor, you have a more diverse, you have a broader number of stakeholders at the decision making table, which makes for better decisions. Yes. Those better decisions with those stakeholders frequently come at the expense of flexibility, um, which and we're saying flexibility is one of the prime assets of the private sector. Yeah, I I would be careful that you don't um, confuse flexibility with um, let me think of a, a better word. I, I'm not so sure flexibility is. F well, you're saying efficiency. I'm saying a flexibility is part of efficiency uh, as a subset, but I can use efficiency. It, it Maybe it's fairness. Yeah. Fairness. Well, no, no. Fairness is different because I would argue like fairness is assigns a much is a much it provides a lot of guarantees for labor provides a lot of safety for labor provides a lot of opportunity educational support all these things but in providing all of those things that you diminish the ability for the 10 people and the 10 individuals that own the company to make the most efficient decisions because the decisions that are made are made in the interest of people which i'm actually in support of yeah personally yeah, me too but but that making decisions in favor of people and the people's well-being is sometimes at odds with the bottom line, the, the bottom line economics of, of the business. You know, Tesla is a non-union automaker, right? Yeah. Tesla is the most innovative auto company in the world, right? It's just a matter of time. And when that time comes, Tesla will not be as innovative anymore. I don't know that that's the case. There's no relationship between innovation and unions. That's a ridiculous that's the question. That's, that, that's, no, that, that's a ridiculous. That makes zero sense. That it, it absolutely. I'm not saying I agree with you. Again, I'm not, I'm not, that, but, that, but that to, makes but zero to say sense. It doesn't make sense is preposterous. Of course it makes sense. It makes zero sense. There's no, there's no possible relationship between the two. Other than if you are in a growth company and you want the ability and you don't know how many employees you're going to need and you don't 
want to carry a huge burden of benefits and pension and labor guarantees for a company, that it makes more sense to pay a higher hourly rate for non-union jobs that you can then have the flexibility to see how the business grows than to uh, then immediately to inherit the burden of the union contract when you're starting a new company. Okay. Well, and, and it's that new company, those new businesses are the ones that tend to be the most innovative um, because they have the incentive to do so because there isn't the guarantee. The guarantee doesn't exist. Um, yeah, I, again, I'm not going to give you the counselor. I'm not going to give you that innovation dies with unions. I'm not giving you that. I think you're I think there's a there's a. There's a there's a gray area between size of companies, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff that goes with that. And so, no, I'm not going to give you that. So we're going to have to disagree because I actually believe that the protections for workers are more valuable than whatever the cost of innovation is. But I don't see how you can argue that the private sector is more innovative and more efficient. And a component of that innovation and efficiency is managing the burn rate at the beginning and having the flexibility to staff against the outcome and that the ability to manage that at the beginning and staff against the outcome is directly impeded by unions. I, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, okay. I, I don't think that's the case, but I'm not going to, you know, I don't have any, yeah. Why do you not think that's the case? Because I don't think it is because I think there's probably just as many amazing innovative ideas that happen because a company um because because a company doesn't um have an elon musk as an example as their ceo doesn't mean like if elon musk was the ceo of general motors would they be less innovative probably probably not if he had the ability to do things, I'm just saying, you know, like, right, but he wouldn't be able to fire people, right? There, if there was a union at Twitter, he wouldn't be able to fire three out of four people on day one. Uh, that he might not have been able to do. I'm not so sure that that's, you know, there's there's not a lot of cases, Dylan, where people want to fire three out of four people when they buy a company. And I could argue that there should be unions to prevent that. And I actually think there's a California law to prevent that. So again, I'm this. I'm just. I'm willing to say that it's you should that it is okay to give up some of the innovation, flexibility, and sort of very aggressive labor management practices. But you're you're arguing. I guess it's an un, it's an unknowable argument, which is your point, which is that you can't argue that that better worker protections and benefits is inherently in opposition to um, innovative, creative engineering design right. and commercial activity. Right, right. I don't, I just don't, I, I don't think and, and plus you're also talking about a very small percentage of, of the, you know, you're, you're not talking about, you're talking about a very small percentage because you're talking about a manufacturing world more so than you're talking about, you know, more so than you're talking about any kind of like service, you know, world. So I, I I'm not, I don't think it's that I don't I don't think the argument's that important or or, you know, I just don't, I don't think there's much there. So you would say that the private sector is more better at solving, better at managing the world's problems than the public sector, because the public sector has no incentive to adapt or has the smallest. The public sector has no no incentive to be efficient. They don't have any reason to be. They can do things that are incredibly stupid. Um, like they can waste a lot of money on different things. They can, they can spend money on on different things from litigation all the way down to regulations that you can't do in the in the private sector. So the public sector is just, you know, is essentially is a disaster in that regard. If the public sector was run like a private sector, then we, you know, th well, it, it really can't be because it can't be, you know, it can't be monetized in a in a public way. But it's just. It's I don't I don't think that's ever going to I don't think that that relationship will ever change. I don't think you can ever compare the two. But the, the point is that the public sector is a much bigger difference than the private sector. But the, within the private sector, union versus non-union is a, is a much smaller delta, much smaller difference between the relevance of union versus non-union versus private versus public. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. 
does do G, did GM did like whether or, or the writers try? Any, like, does the content get better? Do the cars get better? If the union gets what they want in their demands, is it, re- is it relevant to the product or is it really more just a matter of fairness of a dispute over, you know, who gets which pile of cookies? And it's not really that relevant to the final product, at least not in the short term. I mean, it kind of depends. I think there are situations where, on the one hand, you know, you would like to have people that, you know, have been vetted. Um, and so I think there are situations where you can bring up, you know, like if if I was having somebody that was doing electrical work, you know, potentially in my building or or plumbing or something like that, you know, I, I think and there's lots of other examples, but I think there is a certain level of vetting and expertise and mentoring that probably is pretty valuable as opposed to just, you know, freelancers and anybody doing whatever they say they're capable of doing. So, yeah, I do think there is there is added value. Yeah, for sure. From the union side, you said just in terms of having a, a, a better product in this in the form yeah. of, a, of a, a, consi- a more consistent. Yeah, yeah I think writer, so. builder, whatever, whatever, electrician, whatever. builder. Yeah, exactly. Exists for a reason. That. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I'm just looking at the so the S and P is flipped higher here. I'm just um, looking at a the, little, they're up. Yeah, it's very it's dull. Nothing. It's a lot of nothing. It's a hell of a lot of nothing. And it wasn't even a lot of volatility. No volatility. In the first place. No volatility. Nothing. Just just um, it's a it's a very um, uh, public paint drying session. Bonds. We're up 19 before the number came out. They're up 19 now. Um, S&Ps were um, up six, seven before the number came out. They're up six now. NASDAQ was down 15 before the number. It's down six. Russell's the same price. Everything's the same. Crude oil's the same. The world did not change with the last Fed announcement. So again, everything normalized. In a, in a highly volatile market, everything will normalize within 48 hours. In a dull market like we're in now, everything normalized within a few minutes. Kind of fascinating, but you know, every day fascinating display of the market's efficiency. Yeah, yeah, it's, now, like, a, it's like a it's like a showcase. Yeah, but the problem with marketplace efficiency is that marketplace efficiency is not good for the good kids. You know, we're what the good kids, mean? meaning that um, we live on inefficiencies. So the whole tasty. Um, the whole Tasty, the whole foundation of, of really what we do at Tasty is um, we're opportunists that we're opportunists that sees what we what we believe are, you know, our brief periods of inefficiencies, pops in volatility, that kind of thing, you know, pops in in fear. Fear creates kind of things that go a little out of whack and and things that go a little out of whack create, you know, better opportunity than things that are in, in whack. And I think that that's. You know, this is not our favorite markets right now. Yeah, for, for somebody that's a passive investor that's not going to touch their portfolio, their their um, their the volatility of their portfolio right now is like is ne- is next to zero. So that's that's cool for them. But for us, you know, like for active traders, you want some. Um, uh, yeah, you you want some craziness. Ironically, the very efficient market that you celebrate on a pedestal is the greatest enemy to this entire undertaking as a business. Um, yeah. I mean, why do you believe that AI will never be able to create a market algorithm that outperforms? I don't believe AI will be able to create anything that outperforms because AI can only be as good as as the friends that it, the average of the friends that it keeps, which means that to me, AI will always be the average of the inputs. And in order to be an outlier, you can't be uh, you can't be inputted, <laughs> if that makes sense, meaning that meaning that. AI could possibly help to run Ford, but AI could never create Tesla. 
And so if you want to talk about the future of capitalism and, you know, outliers and everything else, the 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 brilliance of of Tesla and and Meta and and Google and everything else is that there is no circumstance where any of those could ever be created from AI. And and that's I think. But couldn't AI do a, a level of back testing that's never been done before, and 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 looking for variable weightings in whatever the upstream, you know, data set is? No, because it, it requires inputs that they just don't. That that again, you can never be of whatever its subset is, of whatever its use user group is. It, it, it can never be outside of that. It's not capable of it. It only knows what it knows. And so it can't know what's like. Th that's why AI to me doesn't, it doesn't scare me at all. It doesn't, I don't even think about it. Like today, Vanetta did a piece this morning, talked about, you know, is the CEO of your, is the next CEO you have of your company going to be, you know, just, just a bot, is it an AI machine? They're like, why do you need a real CEO? You can just have, you know, AI and I, your, your operational person can be all AI. And I agree, your operational person could be AI, but who wants an operational CEO? You know, what you want is a visionary. And who is, you know, who is that visionary? It's it's not AI, which it can't be any better than what it knows. So so I don't really AI doesn't have the same impact on me as it has on others. In terms of its relevance, in terms of its um, AI, in your opinion, offers no deep insights. It simply offers expedited operation. Yeah, it offers it offers a very efficient. It offers it offers a very efficient operation without emotion. So it offers you an, a, the ability to to execute without all the the um, troubling aspects of emotion. And for some people and businesses, that's a really good thing because it takes out all the craziness. You know, um, for other things, uh, if you want your business to be an outlier, then you have a really difficult situation because it won't happen. If you want a visionary, it won't happen. If you want an outlier, it won't happen. You are basically trapped into some, you know, in, into some known model. And that's mm -hmm. it. That's why. What if I just want market outperformance? Well, that's, it's, it's hard to say. You're going to need, there's probably going to need, you're going to need some external factor that is, you're going to need something external that has to push you to that level. So like in the world of like, Finance, the example would be at a brokerage firm, AI can help build, you know, a great operational structure at a financial service firm. But if you want out market out performance, you're gonna have to have some event that creates market activity that you can't control. Again, it gets back to the whole argument we had last week or discussion we had last week, and I have all the time about things you can control versus things you can't control. If you you can control what you input into your bot to create AI to, that will allow you to have something that is incredibly functional and that gives you an efficient operation, but you could never get beyond that. Mm -hmm. Are you doing anything with oil in this recent advancement yeah. in oil? Does it mean anything to you? Yeah, I'm short it. I'm and short. You, and now do you suddenly feel public being short oil? Um, I don't really feel public being short oil, but I'm short it. I'm absolutely short oil, and um, um, I'm not crazy giant short oil, but I'm just short oil. And I think it's the right play here based on price extreme. I'm not taking any fundamental, any crap from other, I'm not even listing other traders or anything like that. You don't want to talk about the Saudi Arabians or the French or any or the weather in... Uh South America. I don't give a rat's ass about the Saudi Arabians or the weather in South America or or anything anywhere or some oil well in or a backroom deal in Vienna. I don't care. Russians. Nope. Uh -huh. Just all based on price. I've been selling it um, and I've been covering. I just covered it. Actually, just covered one of my positions just when the number came out. Um, every rally we've been selling, every sell off we've been buying it back. It's just a trade. All right. You know, when you look at oil right now, it's one of the few underlyings that's actually moving around. So I'm trading it because I'm I'm uh, a little bit, you know, desperate for something to trade. What else are you trading in your desperation? 
Oh boy. Um, trading a lot of bonds. Um, um, trading oil bonds, Japan in the futures world, I'm trading oil bonds, Japanese yen, yield curve, and Russell Nasdaq. Uh, those are my biggest positions. Um, today everything's okay, but lately it's been kind of a, you know, just every day has been up and down. You know, one day you make, the next day you lose. It's been it's been pretty much very cyclical. And then in the equity world, I'm just trading a ton of underlyings, but. Um, but my positions are all relatively delta neutral. Like today, I put on thirteen trades, most of them from our customers. I love because our customers. You like them, and, and, and why would you put on a customer's trade? Because they made because because they they gave me an idea, so I did it. I'm I'm in I I'm, I need to see people to give me ideas. If people gave me ideas all day long, I would put on a hundred trades a day. Really? Yeah, because because I'm as long as you understand our mechanics. I'm indifferent to the the concept of trading is I just have to find underlyings to trade. And so if somebody can find a place that has any anything on the edge of it where you can put your mechanics into work, you'll take a shot. Hundred percent. As long as it's basically little... because you're like no one knows anyway. Exactly. So as long as I have some sort of mechanical qualification, it's as good as good a shot as anything. Y exactly. Exactly. That's that's think about this. That's what that's what every high frequency firm does. I'm just a, I'm just a little tiny player in that in that world, you know. Like like you know. I mean, if you are if you're the counterparty, if you're a market maker, that's what your life is. I've spent 40 years of my life doing that. Whatever you want to do, I'll do the opposite. So I don't care. As long as there's a little tiny bit of edge, I'll do the opposite. And as long as it's liquid enough that you can get the hell out when you want to. That's right. Like, I'm not going to buy your house for me from you because you sell to me five thousand dollars under fair value. I'm not going to buy I'm not going to buy your condo from you because you sell to me, you know, twenty five thousand dollars under fair value. Because or, or my my one of a kind, uh, you know, Dominique Wilkins jersey. Well, that I might because I like Dominique. OK, but that's different. That was emotional. That's not financial. It's one of my favorite players, just so you know. Well, I I listen. Who brought him up? I, well, obviously, oh. he he's, he has an impact on both of us. But yes, <laughs> he was the greatest. Anyway, and also speaking of greatness, have you been watching Deion Sanders in Colorado? Yeah, sure. Don't you think he's just doing great? Well, I think it's a fascinating story about superstardom because I I'm one of these people that argue there is there's certain things in in the world that you can't like. You know that you just you can't put a number on, and you, you. I try to argue this in business all the time. There are certain people, there are certain superstars, there are certain there's certain talent that you you just um you can't make a market. Like like Elon Musk is one of these people. Just as an example, you could you could talk about Dion, you can talk about Elon, you can talk about like there's no number. You know. Like there's no number. What's he worth? It turns out, you know, like what's Elon worth to the economy of Texas? What's what's Dion worth to the economy of, you know, of um, of college football and and college football, Colorado, you know, University of Colorado. Is it is it is it five billion? Is it 10 billion? They pay this guy, what, 20 million dollars a year, 10 million dollars a year, whatever it is, some crappy number. You know, it's the old, it's the old, you know, LeBron thing, the same thing, you know, to what's he worth to, to the city of Cleveland? You know, what was Michael Jordan worth to Chicago? I would argue that Michael Jordan, you know, changed this city and probably, you know, changed this city forever. No question about it. 100 billion. 100 billion. Yeah, at least. Easy. Easy. You know, and we paid him nothing. You know, I mean, I mean, yeah, he's a billionaire now, whatever else. But but the point is, you know. It's just there's certain things you can't. You but, know, you'll put, you're, but you're willing to put Dion with Michael Jordan and Elon Musk in terms of great in terms of uh, influence in, in the very short term. Like, I don't know if D, Dion longevity, longevity. We'll see. Not yeah, longevity. Long we'll see. And Dion could, you know, he seems pretty grounded, but he could he could implode. Um, you know, he could do something stupid. He could implode. But but on a short term basis, there is no other story like him. In business so or in, so far in business and or, and or sports and sports college sports let's 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 not let's face it it's a big business college sports is you know it's a multi you know hundred billion dollar business and and he is a big part of that business 
I love it. I enjoy. I loved him when he played. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying everything that he's doing and that's going on. Uh, it's made me more interested in college football than I've been in decades. Yeah. What's he worth to ABC? And what's he worth to, you know, ESPN? I mean, what's he worth to people just turning, you know, tuning in a game at 930 at night on a Saturday night to watch a college football game? You know, like especially for the half ass fans like me who don't really care at all. Exactly. But then all of a sudden Party Boy shows up with his white cap hat in his <laughs> mouth and he's got everything going. And so all of a sudden we're having a good time. There you go. It's called capitalism, man. Love it. <laughs> but, you know, like, it's it's called capitalism. It's great. And uh, But somebody has to take a shot. Somebody had to hire him. You know, listen, he went to a school that sucked. They had no risk. You know, he went to, um, to, to Colorado. They were horrible. And they had no risk. They didn't even have any money to pay him. I mean, you know, he just... You know, they all took a shot. Geniuses. I'm Tom Sosnoff. He's Dylan Radigan. We went a little bit long today. That was fun, Dylan. Thank you. Next time we go white cowboy hat, mirror sunglasses. See you in a week. Ciao. Bye.